that you allow a Baptist into this pulpit. Uh, the man was preaching away and saying, is everybody here a Baptist? And one man raised his hand and said, no, I'm an Episcopalian. And he said, why are you an Episcopalian? He said, well, my mother was an Episcopalian. My father was an Episcopalian. They raised me to be an Episcopalian. He said, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. If your mother was an ignoramus and your father was an ignoramus, would, would you be an ignoramus? And the man said, no, I'd, I'd probably be a Baptist. You know, that was his response. <laughs> it took me a while to learn other ways of praying because I prayed the way I was taught to pray, to read off a list of non-negotiable demands to the Almighty, telling God a lot of things that God already knew. Dear Lord, Sister Mary is sick in the hospital. Well, what do you think God is saying? Whoa. I didn't know that. Which hospital? The Bible's pretty clear. He knows what we have need of before we even ask. I still make my request known to God, but it's to establish dependency. It's not to inform God. I think that sometimes our prayers are like my son when he was uh, nine years old coming into the living room saying, I'm going to bed. I'm going to be praying. Anybody want anything? And we make prayer as though it was a visit to Santa Claus, uh, asking God for this and that and the other thing. A real transition occurred in my life when somebody introduced me uh, to the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. Uh, I learned other ways of praying. And one way is to wake up early in the morning before I have to and lie in bed in absolute stillness and center down on Jesus. I belong to an African-American church, and uh, we have a spiritual. Woke up this morning with my mind, stayed on Jesus. Those of us who come from more traditional churches, um, white churches, have our own version. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will strain, become strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. It takes me about 15 minutes to push the animals aside. The animals being the 101 things that come in to capture my thinking the minute I wake up. C.S. Lewis says, they're the animals. You've got to get rid of them. You've got to push them aside so that there's only Jesus. And in the quietude and in the stillness of the morning, I wait until I'm still and center down on Jesus. And then I ask God for nothing. I simply surrender and wait for the Spirit to invade me. You all know that passage from the 40th chapter of Isaiah, they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up like eagles and fly, they shall run and not be weary, they shall walk and not faint. We all know that verse, but how many of us wait? Wait. Later on in that same passage of scripture, the prophet writes, and in quietude and in stillness, he will come into you. To surrender, to yield. They asked Mother Teresa once, when you pray, what do you say to God? She said, I don't say anything, I listen. So the interviewer said, well, when you pray, what does God say to you? She said, God doesn't say anything, God listens. And then she added, if you don't understand that, I can't explain it to you. I do understand a kind of praying where you say nothing and you hear nothing. But in quietude and in stillness, you center down on Jesus and wait for his spirit, the Holy Spirit, to invade, to penetrate, to come alive within you, to fill you up. When the spirit invades you, the spirit empowers you. Jesus said it well. You can do nothing without me. Without me, you can do nothing. There are hard things that need to be done in the name of Jesus. And without his spirit within you, you may not be able to do those hard things. During World War II, not a single Bulgarian Jewish person ever died in a concentration camp. Not a single one in spite of the fact that Bulgaria was a Nazi nation. I mean, it wasn't that Hitler and his armies had to conquer Bulgaria. It was a Nazi nation before the world even started, 
Before the war began, it was a Nazi nation. What happened was this, that the SS troopers came into town on the train. The cattle cars were lined up behind the engine. The train pulled up at the station at about 7 in the evening. The SS guards had gathered up as many Jews as they could find and had them down at the train station, trapped in a barbed wire enclosure. It was a rainy, misty night, foggy. When out of the darkness came Metropolitan Kirill, the leader of the Bulgarian church. He stood six foot four to start with, but those, those Orthodox priests wear miters on top of their heads that give them an extra foot. So imagine this huge figure, seven foot four, coming out of the fog, huge white beard hanging down in front of his black robes. Behind him came about 300 of the townsmen. They had to hurry to keep up with him because his gait was so great. He came to the entrance of the barbed wire enclosure. The SS troopers raised their guns against him. He, he, he said, I'm going in. They said, you can't. He said, I'm going in. They said, Father, if you go in there, we're not going to let you out. He pushed the guns aside, marched in. The Jewish people gathered around, waiting to hear what the leader of the church had to say in their hour of trial, in their hour of despair. They knew what was waiting for them at the end of the train ride. He raised his arms in the air, and he screamed one verse of scripture. And with that verse, he changed the destiny of a nation. What's the verse, you ask? He yelled at these Jewish people about to be shipped off to who knows where. The words from the book of Ruth. He yelled at them, whithersoever thou goest, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And the Jewish people cheered. And the Christian men who were outside the barbed wire, they cheered. The uproar was so loud and so great that frightened people came out of their houses and charged down to the train station. And the crowd grew larger and larger and larger. And the SS troopers realized they couldn't get away with it. They boarded the train themselves and left and never came back again. A man empowered by the Spirit of God had courage, had the courage to do what most of us would find almost impossible to do. The Holy Spirit invaded him, empowered him, enabled him. But there's something more that the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit on the personal level enables us to engage people in a new way. I was walking down Chestnut Street in Philadelphia, and a homeless man came stumbling towards me. It was early in the morning. He was holding in his hand a cup of McDonald's coffee. His, his clothes were musty. He was covered with soot. He had a huge beard, and it was greasy. And He was one of those homeless people that's somewhat schizophrenic. He was yelling and screaming at somebody who wasn't even there. You've probably seen such people on the streets. And he's yelling and screaming, and he spotted me. And he yelled at me, hey, mister, you want some of my coffee? When I looked at the styrofoam cup smudged from the grease off of his beard, I, I have to tell you, I didn't want any of his coffee. But I knew the right thing to do was to affirm his generosity. So I took the cup, and I took a sip, and I gave it back to him, and I said, you're being generous. You're, you're giving away your coffee to strangers. <laughs> What's gotten into you today, fella? You're giving, giving your coffee to people you don't even know. He looked at me, and he said, well, the coffee today was especially delicious, and I figure if God gives you something good, you should share it with people. I thought, oh, no. This sucker has set me up. It's going to cost me $10. <laughs> I said, uh, you've set me up. You want something from me in return, don't you? He said, yeah. I want a hug. I was hoping for the $10. 
he put his arms around me, I put my arms around him, and then I realized something. He had me in a bear hug. He wasn't going to let me go. People are passing on the streets. They're staring at me. I, I'm embarrassed as they pass and stare at me. I, but little by little, my embarrassment turned to awe and reverence because I could hear a voice echoing down the corridors of time saying, I was hungry. Did you feed me? I was naked. Did you clothe me? I was sick. Did you care for me? I was a stranger. Did you reach out to me? The passage you just heard. I was that homeless man you met on Chestnut Street. Did you hug me? Or if you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. And, and suddenly I realized it wasn't simply a homeless man I was holding in my arms. He had become sacramental. That Christ himself was presenting himself to me through this homeless man. It was St. Francis of Assisi who said the poor and the downtrodden, they are sacramental. Now, when you say sacramental, the Catholic people here all get happy because they're very sacramental. They believe that in the Eucharist the bread becomes literally the flesh of Jesus and the wine literally the blood of Christ. At the other end of the line are, are Baptists. We believe that the bread stays bread, and the wine is transformed into grape juice. That's Baptist theology. In the middle are you Episcopalians and Lutherans, and you say it's still bread. It's still wine. But a sacred presence infuses the elements. So that as you eat the bread and drink of the cup, you are really ingesting the presence of Christ himself. There is a kind of sacramental quality to that, isn't there? The poor and the oppressed, said Francis, are sacramental. In fact, Christ came to me through that man on Chestnut Street. There was a time in my life that I was totally transformed by such an encounter. Some of my students from Eastern University, where I've taught for years, a, a Christian school, a faith-based school. I, uh, I, I was down there in, in Haiti, checking out their work. I was up in the north, just across the border in, in the Dominican Republic, standing at the edge of a grass landing strip, waiting for a little Piper Cub airplane to pick me up and take me to the capital. All of a sudden, this, this woman was there beside me, holding in her hands her little boy. The child was almost dead. The hair had turned rust color from lack of protein. The arms and legs were as spindly as sticks. The eyes were rolled back. She held up this dying child to me, and she said, don't let my baby die, mister. Please take my baby. Take my baby to your country. Take my baby to a doctor. Feed my child. Take care of my child. Take my child and make my child your child. Please. I tried to explain to her that I couldn't do that. She wasn't listening. She kept on pleading. I was relieved when the little airplane came into sight. The minute it touched down at the end of the grass landing strip, I pushed her aside. I rushed towards her away from her. I rushed towards the airplane. She came after me, screaming at me. Take my baby. Don't let my baby die, she kept screaming. Take my baby, please, take my baby. I climbed into the cockpit, closed the plexiglass door. I told the pilot, don't turn off the engine. Get it revved up again. Let us, let's get out of here. Not fast enough. She was alongside of the plane, banging on the fuselage, screaming at me, don't let my baby die. I could hear her over the roar of the engine. Don't let my baby die, she's screaming. The airplane pulled away from her and into the air. And halfway back to the capital city, it dawned on me who I had left behind. I could hear that haunting voice echoing down the corridors of time saying, I was hungry, did you feed me? I was naked, did you clothe me? I was sick, did you care for me? I was a stranger, did you take me in? 
And I knew that I hadn't just left a baby behind. I had left Jesus behind. Now, granted, I could not have taken her. The law would not have permitted it. But I could have done something. I could have, I could have given her the money that I had. I could have done something. I could have done something. That's what Jesus asks of us, to do what we can do, to reach out when we can reach out, and to recognize that the same Jesus who died on the cross, who was resurrected, and who is coming again, waits to be encountered in those who are in need, in those who are hungry, those who are without clothes, those people in Iraq and Iran who are suffering right now, those those refugees in Jordan that are there because we invaded Iraq. And when we did, the Muslim people of Iraq turned on the Christians for the first time in 1,500 years, believing that we, our army, was a rebirth of the Crusades. From 1,500,000 Christians, we're now down to 200,000 Christians. They fled the country. They're living like refugees in in, in Jordan, and, and I don't hear anybody talking about them. They're suffering on the verge of starvation, and I don't hear the church responding. I guess it's because we as Americans are embarrassed knowing that they are there because we have not been what we ought to be. What you do to the least of these, he said, you do to me. This is the this is the message. It's the message that I give to you today. As I wrap up, let me just say, in the great room, which is to the left of me, to the right of you, go out that door and turn left. There's a table from Compassion International. Knowing what I was going to say here, I decided to invite them here. Because there's a whole table full of packets of children in third world countries. Children who won't go to school, who won't get the medical care, the food they need, the clothes they need. Children who, who present themselves to you as though they were Jesus. For the same Jesus that spoke to me on that landing strip in, in, in the Dominican Republic on the border of Haiti, that same Jesus I met on, on the streets of Philadelphia, that same Christ chooses to present himself to each of you through a child who is in need. Yes, it'll cost you something. It'll cost you $1.33 a day. Now, please, most of you can afford it. $1.33 a day, $38 a month, you can change a child's life. Coming into a magnificent sanctuary, you feel the closeness of God. The beauty of the place inspires awe and reverence. But what does the Lord require of you? But to love justice, to do mercy, and to walk humbly with your brother and sister. So in the name of, in the name of Jesus Christ, I say, uh, when this thing's over, why not go to that great room, fill out the little form, pick up the packet, put the Photograph on your wall, you, you, on your refrigerator. Uh, you can write to the child. The child will write to you. You can pray for the child. The child will pray for you. But I would not want you simply to go from this place inspired. I would like you to go from this place committed. Committed to reach out to Christ where he waits to be loved and encountered. In those he calls, the least of these. Pray with me. Father God, make us into instruments of thy peace. Make us into instruments of your love. Fill us with your spirit. Sensitize us so that whenever we look into the eyes of those in need, we will have that eerie sensation that you are staring back at us. We ask this, O oh Father God, O oh Mother God, in the name of the one 
who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.